Good afternoon, welcome. I'm Liz Schaefer, and I'm excited to take you on a virtual tour of some of the exciting pieces in our Scrimshaw collection. I'd like to make a special welcome to our members and to our Nantucket by Design participants. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Nantucket by Design is an event we hold in August. And if you'd like more information about it, please visit our website at NHA.org. So back to Scrimshaw. The NHA has over 1,400 decorative pieces and utilitarian devices in our collection. Now, obviously, we're not going to see all of them today, but we're going to get a sampling in all of those different areas. Um, Scrimshaw is essentially a folk art that is created out of ivory whale teeth, whale bone, and baleen. Sometimes it's combined with mother of pearl, shells, abalone, wood, and other objects. The thing that I love best about Scrimshaw, and it is one of my favorite places to visit in our museum, is that every piece tells a story. It tells us a story about the person who created it, and it also tells us what was going on in, in culture during the time it was created. So when we look at these pieces, you need to take a minute to really look at them carefully and to um, examine them because not only are you going to get a sense of the amount of work that went into creating the piece, but you're also going to get a sense of where this man was. For the most part, it was a man, a man and we'll talk about that. Um, but also what was going on in his mind and possibly even in his heart. So let's talk a little bit about the history of Scrimshaw itself. We don't actually know the origin of the craft or the name. We have no Neolithic specimens, actually, that we know of. You know, history is such an evolving thing that today I can say we don't have any Neolithic specimens and tomorrow we could find one. So I'm speaking at this moment. Um, the, for the last several thousand years, though, indig indigenous peoples of Alaska and Japan were making images on and with whale and walrus ivory. So that actually is something that's been going on. The Norse, French, and Spanish cultures use cetacean bones in architecture. But almost all of this is done on land, and that's what sets the, our Scrimshaw apart. The British were probably the first to um, engrave whale and walrus teeth and probably done on ships. And then in the 18th century, when Nantucket was rising as, a, as the whaling capital of the world, and our whale, whalers were going out for three to five years, and they were going really after sperm whales, they were getting a lot of teeth. And they decided or they discovered that they could create something out of these teeth. So during the heyday of whaling, which was in the 1820s. From, from then on, uh, there was an abundance of teeth, and we had an abundance of creative men on these ships. So let's look at some of these pieces. This first piece that we're looking at is actually a pan bone, which is the jawbone of a sperm whale. It's believed to be the largest specimen that we have. It was done um, by a British engraver. And you'll see, it, it tells the story of the whale hunt. In the center is the mothership, just right there, straight on. But if you look to the left, you'll see the hunt. And those are the boats that are going after the whale. If you look all the way to the left, you'll see a boat that's been upturned by the whale going underneath it. And that was one of the in lots of different ways. It could turn your boat upside down. If you don't swim, you're doomed. Uh, the whale could decide to dive and possibly take the boat down that way. So it was a very hazardous um, occupation. And then if you look all the way to the right, you'll see that this is after the whale has been caught and is actually dead and has been towed back to the mothership. You'll notice there's red in the water and that indicates that it's time for them to, be, to begin processing the whale. And so they're going to try it out. And they're going to start cutting, it, cutting the whale, the blubber from the whale. And then they're going to have to turn that blubber into oil. So you get the whole scene 
in this uh, huge panoramic um, pan bone. This is also something that was engraved on a, a pan bone, a piece of, of the whale jaw, and this is a plaque. Again, the scene is all about the hunt. This is what, this was the men's lives. This is what they're living, breathing, dreaming about is always the whale, the whale, the whale. Um, that's, they got paid by how much oil they brought back at the end of their voyage. What's interesting about this piece, aside from the detail and the carving at the top with the flags and the intricate detailing, is the latitude and longitude that's engraved in the bottom, because that places this particular voyage in the South Pacific near Australia. So how was this engraving done? A whale's tooth, as you see on the left, was a, a pretty coarse object. There were ridges and grooves, and it had to be made into the shiny piece that you see on the right. Now, to put this in context, let's, let's remember these men are, on, for the most part, on a moving vessel. They don't have dainty hands. They have gnarly hands that do a lot of hard work with thick ropes and um, big wooden oars and are busy all the time and yet they will take this tooth and first they'll take a piece of shark skin or if they are lucky enough to have a file or some other abrasive and they will sand it down until it is smooth and shiny and they have the surface that they can work on. Um, the next thing that they're going to do is they're going to take the tips of their jackknives and they're going to engrave this uh, tooth with their design. Now, some of them were not natural born artists, and so they would do a transfer. They would take a, a picture from a magazine or a book, and they would lay it onto the tooth, and then with the tips of these jackknives, make hundreds if not thousands of, thousands of pinpricks, and then later take the, um, the design off and then connect the dots. And they had to really carve this very, very deeply. Now, if they were natural artists, they couldn't do this freehand. But again, they're going very, very deeply with the tip of a jackknife. Some men may have had a scrimshaw needle uh, that was attached to a little handle, but the majority were really done with this technique of carving the lines, the designs, and they're all not straight lines, as you can see. And then when they, when they had the design the way they wanted it, they would take the soot from the triworks or from the lamp black, and they would rub it into their design and then whisk it off and see how clearly the design had, uh, had been set. And then, of course, would know where they had to go back over their work. Now, you'll notice, even in this example, there is some color underneath the picture that's on top. Where did they get the, the colored ink? Well, they could get it from vegetation when they went into port. They could uh, get it from a tattoo artist. They could make their own. So they, would, they were able to get some colored inks uh, at some point in time. But for the, for the majority of the time on the ship, they would use the uh, triworks, the soot, and that would be the start of their work. So you can see it was a very involved painstaking process. Um, these men had quite a bit of downtime. The average whaling voyage was three to five years. They are not always uh, getting whales hand over fist. And so when they were not doing their chores and they were allowed to just hang out, this occupied their time. Um, I've been told there were baskets of these teeth. If, if it was a successful voyage and they'd gotten quite a few uh, sperm whales, they would have baskets of these teeth on board. Now, most of these teeth are not signed or even dated, but Edward Burdett, who is one of the biggest names in um, historical engravers and in, in scrimshanding, uh, 
signed and dated his work. He was taught by British sailors, and he started when he was just 17 years old going out on the ship Foster. He rose through the ranks and uh, was able to really make some beautiful, beautiful pieces. Sadly for him, his, on his last trip, which his last trip was fatal, he got his leg caught in a harpoon line and was dragged overboard. Uh, we are lucky to have two of his teeth. And if you look at the, the picture on the bottom again, whale hunt, and the, uh, you get the whole story. You get the ships at either side or with the boats on either side with the whales. One looks like it's just, the one on the right looks like it's spouting water. The one on the left in my, with the way I'm imagining it, as I said, each one tells a story, but the way I imagine it because it's colored in, that that whale might actually be spouting blood. And so when that happens, it's going to die and then they will bring it back to the mother ship. What's interesting about this particular tooth is that on the back, if you look at the top, you'll see the back of the tooth. Edward Burdett did not uh, write what is on the back of the tooth. This one was um, done by someone else. It was presented by Peter Ewer and it was given to someone at, in Nantucket in 1846. And so this tooth um, still has the total Nantucket experience on, with it, even though it's, it was finished after Edward Burdett had passed away. Another, another um, important person is Frederick Myrick. He's perhaps the earliest known um, scrimshander to sign and date. And his pieces are also highly prized by museums and collectors. Now he only shipped on two voyages, but he was very, um, well, he was either very good at this or he had a lot of downtime or this was really his passion because he, he created 37 teeth of, with a scrimshaw. And the motif is pretty repetitive. It is usually, it is the ship, it is the Susan. Um, in various stages, you'll, see, you'll notice the tooth on the bottom. Again, you have the whaling voyage, the whaling hunt, the boats are in the water. His, um, his water is just those straight little ripple lines. He would cap his, his teeth, if you look over on the right, uh, above the eagle is uh, the date. So he would sign and date them. And he also, the Susan off the coast or on the coast of Japan. So again, we get, we get to see the hunt. We get to see where he was. We get to see that he's proud to be an American. He has the eagle there. He dates them and he signs them. If you look at the the ship at the top, that one is even more intricate. I was listening today to someone talk about this tooth and he pointed out that the tooth on the top, if you look at the, those very top sails, they're actually full. If you look at the tooth on the bottom, those top sails are furled. And so it makes me think the, the one on the top, they're on their way home. Uh, a lot of Myrick's teeth were about going home. We love Nantucket. And there's a lighthouse in that, on that tooth as well. And supposedly it is Sankety Lighthouse. So he's really on his way home because that's very close here in Sconset. There you get, you, there you get a really good close up of the figures in the water the intricacies of the sails and the rigging lines and um, of the Susan on the coast of Japan. And looking closely, you can even see, I don't know, I get a sense that, you know, the writing, even in the word Japan, and you can almost feel him etching, not etching, but carving that in. We have been told etch is not a word that we use. We, we say carve. So want to give you the best information that we possibly can. So if you, these teeth were done by Dr. William Roderick, 
He was a um, highly acclaimed um, surgeon, a ship surgeon in England or from England. And these have a whole different feel to me. The you know, surgeon, okay, his hands are going to be very steady. But the way he interpreted the water is really interesting. The movement here is so much more layered. And um, you can, I, to me, I can almost get seasick looking at it. The tooth on the right, again, the hunt. The boats are out. There's red in the water, so there's been some, some success there. Uh, the mothership in the background, land even beyond that. And then on the uh, other side is a landscape view of the boats in pursuit of the sperm whale. And it is just, um, it's coming across the, an emerging whale with the mothership in the background. And keep in mind that after this uh, Leviathan beast was killed, it had to be towed back to the ship and it might have been pulled several miles. So not only was the hunt arduous, but also getting the whale back to that mothership. Um, so all this, all this is celebrated in these teeth in very different interpretations that are all just so stunning. You can tell I am really in love with Scrimshaw. We're just gonna go back a little bit. There you go. Okay. Scrim Shanders, you know, they uh, also love depicting patriotic themes. It wasn't all about the ships. These men are on board with usually not any other women on board, maybe the captain's wife, and she was not really focusing on them that much. So here we have Lady Liberty with a bow, maybe it's an olive branch. Um, some, some greenery, she's on a checkerboard, the stars and stripes are on the side, and colored inks were used, as I mentioned before, to just enliven it a little bit. Um, they also, uh, we have some examples that, of how they would transfer the designs as well in the next, um, the next trio here. So Harper's, Harper's had a, um, a fashion magazine. It was called Harper's New Monthly Magazine. And one of the great things the men loved when they were on these ships was when they passed another ship and they could exchange newspapers and magazines. And so chances are that the men got a hold of this Harper's piece and they, they took them and transferred these three designs. So not only do we get some of the men thinking longingly of their fiancés, girlfriends, sisters, mothers, wives back home. We also get to see a little bit of what the, the fashions were back in those 1800s. Very tiny waist on this one on the right. Um, their hair is in all different styles. Seems they like earrings. And um, again, the intricacy of this being done on a moving vessel is pretty breathtaking. Um, I think that it, that there's just there's just so many stories that you can imagine. And when you get to come to the museum and you come and look at our collection of these, I think that you'll be inspired to make up some of your own stories to go along with them. So today I got to go into the museum for the first time in many months just to see what it's looking like as we're getting ready, hopefully to open in July. And I got to see this dressing stand. It is a, a tabletop little bureau, but I actually measured it today because looking at it here, you can't really see that it is almost 36 inches tall from mirror to the bottom. Uh, it has a pivoting mirror. It was made by Captain James Archer for his wife. He was aboard the ship Afton. Uh, now, he was on a voyage that only yielded about 335 barrels of oil. And usually you wanted to have come home with about 2,000. So he wasn't all that busy. So he had a lot of time to make this gift. 
It has about 1900 individual pieces of wood, metal, whale, and ivory all together. And all those, the little drawers open up. It's really exquisite. I hope you get to see it in person, but um, I'd be pretty happy if my husband brought that home for me to tell you the truth. These are my all time favorite pieces and we have dozens. If you're a baker, they may look like, a pie, like pie crimpers to you and you'd be right. In the old days, they were known as jagging wheels. Most of the men on these ships uh, didn't get a lot of great food. And so, I, and my story is that they would dream about the pies that their moms and their wives and their beloveds would make for them when they got home. And so they would bring them this token. And these are probably made out of whale bone for the most part, but they could be inlaid with baleen or tortoise and they can have ivory accents. They definitely are um, just exquisite pieces. The one with the snake on the bottom, the middle one has some tines at the end on the left, and that would be like a fork so you could actually pierce the crust. So these are really thoughtful, thoughtful gifts, thoughtful because you're missing someone at home and also a little selfish because like, hey, here's a jagging wheel, make me a pie. An intimate gift you might make for your um, wife or an intended uh, fiance, someone you have publicly um, made your intentions known, would be a busk. And these actually take my breath away. In the middle, you, have a, you see the corset and it has a center panel. And the, the pieces on either side usually made of out of bone or baleen because they're a little more flexible. These busks would go down that center panel. And I imagine that's a way for a whaler to keep, to let his beloved know that she is close to, uh, he is close to her heart. So there are scenes on the one on the left, the, the one just, just to the immediate left of the corset, is all, di uh, all different flowers or interpretations of flowers. Um, the one on, on, the near, on the near right is actually the one that truly takes my breath away with the heart at the top and all those little cutouts. And I can only imagine how, how carefully this was carved um, with fingers crossed the whole time that there wasn't a slip of that knife and the piece uh, was broken. And the one on the right too, just so sweet with, with the gentle, just delicate flowers. And so again, it, uh, a gift of love for sure. Now in terms of utilitarian devices, what better than a walking stick or a cane? Um, definitely needed for mobility but it was also a fashion accessory for both men and women. We have about 150, if not more, in our collection. And most of them are made, the shaft is wood or it could be a solid piece of a, of a jawbone. Um, the handles would be carved with the grips um, in ivory and their inlays of baleen. And there could be tortoise. Some of them might be a bird handle or could be hands or serpents, but these are, are really pretty magnificent themselves. If you, if you knit, this might look familiar to you. you. We use them in a different form today. These are known as swifts, and they were a tool for taking a skein of yarn and turning it into a ball where the ball of yarn would go. This adjusts um, in and out, usually, well, I will say it's made of, of whale bone because each of these pieces has to be, has to be consistent in size, in um, length, you know, in thickness. And the person making this um, device would be a captain. You have to have room in your quarters to lay out about a hundred 
of these pieces and line them up to make sure they're all they're all identical. And the captain and possibly a first mate would be the only ones to have that kind of a luxurious accommodation on a ship. Um, most of them would be clamped to the end of a table. The one we're showing you here is attached to a table and it's a three-legged table. So let's hope that it's really sturdy because once this expandable swift um, starts to rotate, it could cause the table to go off balance. They are nailed, they are nailed together or and or tied with little tiny ribbons. So again, just imagine the person making this swift and then imagine the lucky person to get it. Mm. A sewing room accessory might be this spool rack. It has a pin cushion at the top. It has little tiny round abalone dots on each side going around the cup. It is a most useful and beautiful gift. And again, made certainly made by someone um, to, to give to his wife or daughter or some other woman in his life. I, I should mention that I'm, all, I'm always attributing this uh, piece to go to someone specifically, but um, a lot of the, not everyone gave, um, brought their pieces home. Some, some men would bring the teeth home as, as mementos or souvenirs or to give as gifts, but sometimes they were also used to barter uh, when, they, when they went into port, if the men didn't have money, they might use it to exchange for something that they wanted. So they were a form of currency as well. And I did mean to mention that before. This is a watch stand and uh, men wore pocket watches. And so it was a place to put the, your watch and the watch fob and not have it tangled up. I did see this one in the museum today and sort of foggy and humid today on Nantucket. And I was particularly taken that these women had curly hair because um, fog on Nantucket does, does help, help your curls a little bit. So I thought it was, it made me smile today when I looked at this one. It's a very impressive piece. Again, we don't, we don't give, you, give it to you in scale, but it is definitely, at least um, I would say eight to 10 inches high and, and it would make a stunning, a stunning piece on a man's dresser for sure. Candlesticks, a symbol of maritime prosperity. These are ivory and bone, a combination, and probably would hold the spermaceti candles. Spermaceti candles were odorless, dripless, smokeless, replacing tallow candles, um, which were just the opposite, didn't give much light, were, were smelly, dripped all over the place. These gave a very clean white light. These candles, spermaceti candles, were really um, in demand. And some of the wealthiest people living in America in the mid-1800s lived right here on Nantucket, and it's because they sent spermaceti candles, which were made here, as far away as China, and uh, they made their fortunes. Beautiful little doll bed made out of pan bone by Captain Timothy Upham. We don't have any dates of um, or name of the vessel he captained, but we do know he had a daughter, Delia. And so uh, with the tree motif on the headboard, and the mortise and tenon joints where with the tree motifs in the corners there as well. It's just such a sweet gift for a captain to make for his daughter. Helen Marshall was born in the Azores and spent the first eight years of her life aboard the ship, a ship with her father, Captain Joseph Marshall, and her mother, Malvine Pinkham Marshall. It's reported that one of the second mates found her such a delightful child that he made her this jump rope. It is braided hemp with ivory handles 
and Turk's Head Knots. And um, lucky little girl. And of course you recognize this, this piece, the infamous Nantucket basket. Jose Formoso Reyes was a premier basket maker and he was the first island maker to collaborate with island scrimshanders. And this is where the women come into it because um, we were asked at, at one point if all, if all scrimshaw was done by men. And an educated guest would tell you on ships, most likely, unless someone was teaching the daughter of someone who was on board. But on land, um, we, had two, we, we had two very fine women scrimshanders. Aletha Macy was um, making scrimshaw. She worked with Reyes and made seagulls and dog's heads. And she even had a shop called Ivory of the Sea in the 1950s here on Nantucket. And more recently, um, Nancy Chase, who was uh, a scrimshander here on the island and did very innovative pieces, uh, lots of custom pieces. Perhaps someone who's with us today is fortunate enough to have uh, some of her, uh, one, one piece of hers or more, some of her work. And it's very, it, well, when, when they made the oval basket, that became known as the friendship basket. And again, just an exquisite piece with the scriptural clasp, the knobs on the side, and the um, design of the shells on top. So beautiful, beautiful piece. Now, if you can't get to the museum and you'd like to see all, every piece in our collection, or pretty much every piece, the, this book by Stuart Frank Scrimshaw on Nantucket is a beautiful piece. The um, photographs are exquisite. They're actually the ones that you saw used today in this, in this presentation. And it's available in our museum shop, which you can access at nha.org. So if you'd like to learn more and see more, the book is the way to go. Um, today, of course, the use of ivory and killing of animals for their ivory and bone is illegal. And scrimshaw itself has become very controversial. But so it's important for us to remember that the ivory that the whalers used was really just a bypro byproduct. They were there for the hunt. They were there for the whales. And when they finished with the blubber, the only part of the whale that they kept was the lower jaw because that's where the teeth were. The rest of the whale went into the ocean. Um, historic scrimshaw is an art and it is part of our cultural uh, heritage and our legacy here on Nantucket. And that's why we celebrate it and are proud of the pieces that we have. I hope you've enjoyed this glimpse into our collection and we're hoping that we'll be able to open in July and if you're able to come visit us, we definitely are going to be happy to see you. And I wanna thank everyone who's joined us today. I wanna to thank our members who have been uh, so supportive of us during this very challenging time and helped us to make these programs available because we have such a rich culture and heritage here and at the NHA we really want to make sure that we can share it with you as much as, as much and as often as we can. Uh, if you're interested in becoming a member, you can go on NHA.org and find out all about it. When we do open, we will have special times for members and there'll be other uh, pluses to being part of our organization. So thank you for joining me and now we'll be happy to take your questions. Our chief curator, Dan Elias, is going to join us and we'll be happy to answer them the best we can. Hello. Hi, this Dan. is Dan Elias. How are you? Great. Great to hear your voice, Liz. Um, so uh, I guess Al and Mary Novissimo, who are our digital... Uh, yes, our, yeah, there are digital gurus. <laughs> They're going to help us answer questions. Um, and uh, are there questions in the queue? There are. I've got a few here. We'll start from the top. 
Uh, first question was, did the whalers learn any art techniques from the countries they visited? Were their techniques learned from other whalers or just trial and error? Um, clearly, well, that's an interesting question. Um, clearly, there were instances where whalers were teaching each other. The um, Edward Burdett, who is frequently uh, thought of as the first American scrimshander, um, clearly learned, and we actually now have documentation that he was on a ship with uh, another scrimshander, a British scrimshander, uh, called the Britannia Engraver, and um, clearly learned a lot of his chops directly from the Britannia Engraver. They share a lot of stylistic similarities. Um, that said, there are, uh, there are long histories of engraving in whale and walrus uh, tusks in indigenous communities. And the whalers didn't seem to take a great deal from those communities. Uh, it more was between whalers, between ships, between countries. Um, and certainly innovation and trial and error had a great deal to do with the, uh, with the evolving folk art of Scrimshaw. One of the great things about Scrimshaw is that it's a folk art that really is the province of men. Um, many, many folk forms, uh, quilting, uh, you know, different embroidered forms, uh, things like that, were uh, the province of, of women. Um, but Scrimshaw, of course, was really for most of its history up until the 20th century was the province of men. Thank you, Dan. We have another question. I'm not certain which tooth this is referring to, but the question is, what is the flag with the heart? Which might have been a ship's flag. It might have been a whale flag. I'm not sure, but maybe just talk about some of the different flags they used. Well, they raised a red flag when they were homeward bound. Okay. That was the traditional flag. When the men saw the red flag go up, they would be so ecstatic because between that and breaking up the triworks, they knew that they would not, they would not have to catch another whale. Um, the, they do have colors. They, the, the ships all have specific colors because I just finished transcribing um, a journal and she would, Harriet Swain would refer to, uh, you know, the emerald and then she would draw a picture of the emerald flag so whether it was a semaphore uh, and it was the first letter of the emerald or whether it was um, just the ship, the flag of that ship, I'm not sure, but that's what I've come across recently, Dan. The, um, there very often are flags displayed on the ships in Scrimshaw uh, pictures. Um, um, the, sh the flags, certainly country flags, were an important part of the decoration on Scrimshaw, but there were also house flags and pennants um, that told uh, who the owners of the ship were, um, the, the rank of the people, the, the rank of the captain, and so on. Um, but, you know, as far as the fanciful flag with a heart, uh, I don't know if that had a specific connotation uh, or, or association. I don't, I don't know the answer. Okay, we have another question from, it might be from a very long way away. Question is, is there a more precise location for the scrimshaw work in the Southwest Pacific near Australia? I live in Hobart, Tasmania, and the islands and rocks in the scrimshaw resemble those along Tasmania's coast. Excellent. Um, there are, I think, in one case, and maybe it's the Roderick tooth. Um, well, I, I know that uh, Roderick located the scenes of his uh, scrimshaws very carefully. He took good location notes while he was on board ship, and he also carved some of the teeth that he had um, after 
There you go. There you go. Thank you, Al. Um, he carved some of these teeth after he got home, uh, possibly based on notebook sketches that he might have made. We don't have any of those notebooks, but um, but it is conjectured that he made notebook sketches and then carved some of these teeth after he returned from the voyages that he went on. Um, and, and in a number of cases, he locates the scene, for example, here on the left, um, the island behind him uh, very precisely by the dates of uh, when the whales were caught and so on. Okay, our next question. Back to the questions. On the Susan, what is the significance of the square with the cross? A funeral or what? I think I know what they're referring to. Um, I just going to put it up. I don't know offhand, but I'd love to see the Susan's tooth again. Your background will do it. That one right there. I think he's talking about the. Uh, There we go, and the flag. Uh, I think we may they may be uh, referring to the to the uh, blanket with the hook through it. Oh, which does look oh, like oh, oh. does look like a a a, uh, a, a, a square or a tablet with a cross on it. If you go right. back, if you go back to the the screen with both teeth, you can see it, it isn't part of the ship. Yeah. Um, that's a really good observation, Al. I, I like your interpretation of the question. Um, the, the blanket piece that's being drawn up, can, Al, can you go back to the detail shot that you had a moment ago? There might, be a, there might be a whale. Yes, there's a whale. If you look along the water line, you can see the, uh, the whale with its, with its mouth open to the left. Um, the blanket piece is the first is, is the name of, of the strip of blubber that's being brought up, uh, peeled from around the whale, almost like you'd peel an orange. And uh, the way that they brought that very, very heavy, many hundreds of pounds of blubber aboard was that they cut a hole in the top of the blanket, put, an, uh, put a hook through that hole, and in some cases, laid a staff of wood across that hook so that the hook would not tear out of the blubber. So they were uh, hoisting with, you can see, uh, Al, if you can show the, the multi-part uh, block and tackle up above the, um, the, uh, um, the blanket piece, that's hauling and, and peeling the whale, like as if you could imagine peeling an orange by uh, spiraling around the, um, the, the spiraling around the body of the orange with the, with the uh, peel. But that's a great observation and um, thank you for the question. That's, that's great. Okay. Uh, question, gentleman says, I have a number of pieces purchased on the island over the past 50 years, some older and some newer pieces. Am I able to sell any of them or is that now illegal? Uh, interesting question. And there are many layers to the answer. Um, you can sell uh, Scrimshaw within Massachusetts. Um, if you have documentation that it existed prior to 1970, I think it was two, when the uh, Marine Mammal Protection Act national legislation went into effect. Um, if, you, if you have material that you think is, is after, was created after that or with whale teeth create, taken after that time, those are not able to be sold um, in the open market. You can gift them, but they really don't have any commercial value at this point. 
um, work that is documentably from prior to 1972 is on whale's teeth that are documented were documented to be taken prior to 1972. Those can be bought and sold within Massachusetts and in some other states. You need to be careful though because New York and California both ban the purchase or sale of uh, of teeth. Uh, of any kind uh, taken no matter when. So um, it's a complicated picture. There's federal legislation, there's state legislation, and you need to be well aware of uh, your uh, documentation and your uh, legal standing of the tooth in question before you make a move in that direction. Okay. We have a question about I guess, doing the art. Uh, question is, did they use some sort of a jig to hold the tooth or did they do these magnificent teeth freehand? <laughs> uh, Liz, do you have any particular information about that? I've never heard of them having any devices to hold them in the museum. We have, we have a display of some of the tools that they use because not there were things in addition to jackknives um, that they may have had that were more like awls perhaps or very like needles, but mm -hmm. I've never seen, which isn't to say it doesn't exist, but I've never seen that they had anything other than their hand or maybe between their knees. Um, yep. And they, one thing I may not have mentioned is while, while they were out at sea and they're chasing after whales, there are great spans of time when there are no whales. And so there was a lot of downtime. So there wasn't a big rush to, you know, finish the tooth. They had time to engrave it and then to work on it again and add to it. And I think that is part of the reason some of them are so intricate um, because they had the time to revisit and rework them, mm -hmm. you know, for months on end. Yeah. I don't have specific knowledge of tools that were, uh, that were available to hold these these things, the precision of of uh, of many of the teeth, particularly for example, uh, Frederick Myrick's uh, Susan's teeth, leads me to believe that they had a way to immobilize it somehow. And there certainly was a carpenter's shop on board, which would have had a leg vise uh, and other uh, clamps and things that could have have immobilized the teeth. Also, I do know that uh, silversmiths. Um, and people who were making uh, uh, sheet metal work of various kinds use uh, what's called a pitch pot. They will, uh, they'll have a, a bowl filled with pitch, which they can melt and, and immobilize an object. They, they put the, an object into the melted pitch and then let it solidify, and that holds the object in place. I don't know if pitch pots were there certainly were pitch pots on board all of these ships because pitch was an important waterproofing device um, with which they waterproofed the standing rigging and uh, and the and the the wooden pieces that needed to be resistant to salt water. So they did have access to pitch, um, and I would be surprised if people as ingenious and and uh, skilled with their hands as sailors didn't make use of a pitch pot for uh, for that purpose but i can't you know, say for certain what you're talking about. i i can't say for certain that that was the case um, perhaps stuart frank the author of that book has more information about this um, and it's an interesting question uh, i'll check into it okay a little bit different uh, question um, Uh, do scrimshaw pieces weather well over time? Um, depends where you put them. Uh, <laughs> they scrimshaw collectors are very fond of a piece of folk wisdom that says that the oils and and uh, you know natural uh, substances from your hands serve to um, protect. Scrimshaw. They they use that as a justification for why they like to handle all of these things in our collection without gloves. 
uh, because more, normally we like to to handle uh, natural materials with gloves so that you don't contaminate them and get mold and so on. But the scrimshaw collectors are very fierce about their belief that that uh, that these teeth should be handled in order to preserve them. Um, I can't say scientifically that that is necessarily supported. Um, certainly, scrimshaw, if left out in uh, in the weather, would rapidly weather and age and crack. Um, scrimshaw does often check and 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 develop rather bad cracks, um, and there's very little that can be done about that. Um, except to keep them in environments where the humidity is relatively high uh, and doesn't fluctuate. Fluctuation in humidity is the worst, the worst thing for teeth. But in, an, in a protected environment, they should last for a very, very long time. What was the blue pigment that was used on the jump rope? Uh, I suspect that was paint. So the... Um, the jump rope was, uh, if we can see it again, um, the, there's a thing that, that they did with standing rigging. Uh, my, my dad taught me a poem when I was little, and I had no idea what it meant. But uh, when I got older and learned more about standing rigging, um, it made sense, which was, um, what is it? It's worm and parcel with the lay, turn and serve the other way. Um, <laughs> Can you show the 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 image with the uh, coming now the jump rope again? Um, you can see that the if you look at the Turks head knots on the on the top, you can see that you cannot see the grain of the rope, the the um, the actual yarns of the rope that are twisted to make up the rope, uh, and the reason you can't see that. If you look in the in the big part, the 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 whole picture of the uh, jump rope, there's a little bit of fabric coming away from the right hand side, uh, just below the ivory handle. Yeah, right there. Um, there's a little bit of fabric. Well, what that is from is is the um, parceling or covering with strips of fine canvas. Um, that may have been done to make this uh, rope a little easier on tender young girls' hands. <laughs> um, and they would have painted that over in order to preserve the parceling. Um, parceling was done with strips of canvas. It was, it was a way of wrapping the uh, rope so that it was protected from the elements in the case of the standing rigging. But... Uh, but in the case of this, it would have been done to protect the little girl's hands from the harsh manila hemp fibers of the rope. So I think the blue was undoubtedly painted over, uh, over that parceling. And in fact, further down the rope, you can see that the paint extends past the parceling to where you can see, uh, if, you, if you follow all the way up, uh, Al, to where the, the fabric covering ends, you can see the, the twist of the rope itself uh, beyond the parceling, but it's actually been painted blue as well. Okay. Uh, another question. Was Scrimshaw initially just done for personal use, or was it always made to be sold? Liz, do you have an answer? I, my instinct is that it was personal. Um, that, well, it, they had the choice of selling it, as I said, when when the whalers went off off the ship, if they had a piece and they were in a foreign place and they wanted to barter, they were happy to to do so. Maybe they did sell it, or maybe they traded. Um, and then in many instances, it came home as a souvenir or a, or a memento for them of their whaling voyage. Not every whaler went out more than once. It wasn't for everyone. Um, so. I, I'm not, I don't know for sure if anyone said, oh, this is going to be a great tooth and I can sell it for, you know, 50 bucks. I think it was, it was created, it was a pastime. And then when the, when the opportunity arose and someone needed money, if it wasn't a, if you were not on a successful voyage, um, you 
in, you were only going to get paid according to how much oil you came back with. If you weren't going to get paid much and you were out all these years and you wanted stuff, even from the ship store, you needed to have money so you wouldn't be in debt at the end. So I'm sure sometimes there was someone who said, I'll make this and see if I can sell it somewhere. I mean, all this is surmised. It's probably folklore, but with yeah. what we know factually, I think it makes sense. One of the things I just want to mention, because we were, this is Al Novissimo here, we were putting together a lot of the materials to these slides. One of the things I was struck by in going through the collection, we didn't pull them out here because they were not the most attractive things, but the variety of personal effects, everything from handles for hammers to uh, screwdriver handles to a, a carved scrimshaw clothespin. There were so many personal items that were not necessarily attractive, but were clearly part of people's everyday personal lives that were made, yeah. in addition to the beautiful pieces we saw here. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, Stuart in the book does talk about the cash value of Scrimshaw. And certainly in, an, in the initial stages, I think it was done as a pastime. Um, but the 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 very proficiency of a number of the uh, scrimshanders, Edward Burdett and the Britannia engraver and Frederick Myrick, uh, lead me to believe that this was a production line. Um, and that, imagine you're out for, for three to five years and you don't get paid until you come home because they don't know how much profit there will be to divide uh, using the lay system. So you're out at sea with only the money that you brought along with you um, and finding objects of value that could be bartered or exchanged, uh, I suspect was extremely important to, uh, to, the, to the sailors. So uh, talented, talented artists on a ship, um, I suspect were in, in high demand. Um, Stuart talks a little bit about the the uh, the cash economy of Scrimshaw in the uh, I believe in the beginning of this of this book that he wrote for the NHA. Question coming back to the art of the uh, Scrimshaw. Question is: Did any of the Scrimshanders use the whale bones to tell a story, as in a series of etchings on bone to illustrate a story? Do we have anything like that in the collection? Uh, we certainly have objects in the collection that represent events. Um, and most Scrimshaw, in fact, the typical, the most typical scene on Scrimshaw is to have either a boat, uh, a ship uh, chasing whales on one side and then cutting in on the other, which is a kind of a narrative sequence, almost like a comic book, a, a cartoon strip. Um, and uh, there certainly are also scrimshawed images of ships when they are going out, for example, the, the Myrix deep, uh, going out to Japan and coming back from, you know, from a voyage filled with oil and, uh, and heading for home. Um, in that sense, they are narrative. There is at the museum also uh, one of the largest and most beautifully decorated pan bones uh, that exists is in the museum's collection. It was done uh, by a British scrimshander or maybe several, and it depicts um, probably certainly two vessels, but maybe as many as four vessels that were under the command of a, a single individual through the course of his career. So um, you can see on this particular large pan bone uh, all the vessels that he commanded or served on during his 20-year career as uh, a, first as, a, as a, an officer, but then a, of whale ships. Now, this is a British officer. Uh, so, yes, there are narrative sequences on teeth. Um, I don't bring to mind any that are kind of a, a personal narrative, but I'm sure Stuart could tell us about 
about more. And it and it'd be interesting to go through that book and look. Um, I know the book pretty well, but I don't know everything. <laughs> um, anyway, it's a it's a good question. Uh, but yes, there certainly are s- storytelling teeth. Thanks, Dan. You just broke my bubble. I thought you did know everything. Um, <laughs> uh, another question. I just sound like it. My <laughs> wife tells me all the time. Was it typical for scrimshanding to be passed down as a trade within families similar to other trades? Well, that's a really interesting question. I have to say I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I can't think of, you know, Burdett did not have... Uh, obvious heirs. Um, Myrick certainly didn't. Uh, so it's a really good question. I'll have to take a look and see if I can find the answer to that. Great. Um, so I guess you don't know all the answers. No, not even <laughs> close. Do we know how many Susan teeth have been discovered? Do you know that, Liz? I think. Well, there are 37. That's the 37. number I have. But yeah. it doesn't mean that there isn't another one out there somewhere. We, yeah. we do know of 37 teeth. Myrick is, is certainly well researched. He uh, had a very limited career on whaling ships. He only w- went on two voyages. And, um, and he, uh, he has been well documented because he is the earliest American scrimshander, it's believed, to date a tooth, uh, to put a date on a tooth. In, uh, in 1829. So people have tracked his teeth very, very carefully. Uh, so I, I think that 37 number is, is fairly complete and represents a lot of teeth for two voyages. A little different question here. Is it true that the term scrimshaw means to waste time? And is this a credible relation to the idea that sailors would use their free time to complete these works of art? Uh, the only thing I've heard over and over again is what Liz said uh, at the beginning of her talk, that uh, the origin of the word is really disputed and unknown. Um, I don't know of any etymological derivation that would make it uh, about time wasting, but it's a, not a bad theory. <laughs> <laughs> Could the lighthouse on the Susan, Susan Tooth be a picture of the ship returning to Nantucket? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that'd be Brant Point. That'd be interesting, actually, Liz, if, to do the comparison to see if it's Brant Point light um, mm-hmm. in any of its incarnations. Uh, because lighthouses often are colored so that a, a mariner s- spying them can tell what uh, can tell what light it is. So it's an interesting question. I. I'll take it's a look tall, at that. That one tall, looks a little more like Sankity. It's tall to be brand point. Yeah. 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 Interesting. What is the proper word for corset boning? Were multiple bones used at a time in the corsets? I, I only know the one in the center. Well, they, they did package um, stays, corset stays. Now, the busk was this central placket. It would fit it into a central placket down the front of a, of a corset. But there were also corset stays. If you can give us back the picture, Al, of the corset and busks, um, you can see that there were other pockets sewn into that corset for stays. And uh, particularly baleen was used um, for the corset stays, you see the the across the um, across the cups of, where, of of these of this corset, you can see the the the, the sort of W shape. Uh, the verticals in the middle of that W were, uh, I believe, pockets for additional stays, but those would have been made out of baleen rather than bone because uh, they they needed to be flexible for obvious reasons. We do have a couple of bundles of uh, small, r- probably three eighths of an inch wide by eight inch long uh, baleen stays in the collection 
uh, at the NHA, these bundles that were bundled in order to be sold as a, as a, uh, a set of corset stays. Okay, we have one here that seems like a Nantucket by design question. Are there any common residential interior design or decorative methods that incorporate scrimshaw pieces? How are these works typically displayed or even celebrated in a unique visual way? Well, Liz, you were talking about the uh, baskets. I don't know if it, well, there's some of this furniture we have where it's used. I, I don't know why my brain went to murals. Uh -huh. I'm like, I don't think there's, there's scrimshaw in murals. Um, we know on we know furniture, but mm -hmm. I don't know where yes, there certainly was doll furniture. And and there then for example, um, uh, Archer's uh, case, the the dressing case that Archer made, and he made actually uh, at least four of those dressing cases in different sizes, and we have the biggest one, the biggest and best one. Um, but uh, there were also um, pan bone plaques that were done, large scale objects that were done, uh, which were meant to be displayed like a painting in your home. Um, so yes, I think absolutely Scrimshaw was used as interior decoration uh, in a variety of ways. It, the other thing I think of is that watch touch, the, uh, mm -hmm. the, the beautiful, it's a really a substantive piece of, of uh, furniture for the top of a dresser or, or a, a side table in a bedroom. Yeah, absolutely. Coming back a little bit to the mundane, how were the teeth distributed to the sailors? Well, that's a really interesting question. Um, I don't know the answer, but Stuart frequently uh, comments that whale's teeth were you know, kept on deck in baskets for people to take, that they were, um, that they were a byproduct and not especially highly valued. The one major exception to that is um, that whale's teeth were enormously highly valued in Fiji and in Tonga to some degree. Um, in Fiji, there is a, uh, there's an object known as a tambua, T-A-B-U-A, but pronounced with an, as if it had an M in it. Um, and tambua, is, the word tambua comes from the word for taboo, which in uh, most, of the, uh, most of the Polynesian languages means uh, holy. And uh, the tambuas are uh, whale's teeth that are pierced in both ends and often um, adorned with a sinnet, like a, 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 a cord made out of coir, cocoa, cocoa fiber, or else human hair. And um, these were amulets of great power. And at the in beginning of the whaling in the Pacific, you know, around 1800 to 1820, say, these were such powerful objects and such valuable objects in Fiji that you could initially outfit a whale ship for two years uh, just with a single whale to, to trade into Fiji. Um, they could be traded for sandalwood, they could be traded for pigs or for any number of um, valuable objects. And so in that particular part of the Pacific, whale's teeth became extremely powerful and valuable. Um, in general, however, uh, across the Pacific into the northern areas and so on, uh, I don't believe that they were valued very highly uh, among the whalers. Dan, don't we have one of those necklaces in our collection? And the, the, the teeth are not scrimshawed. They're just the raw, right. the raw teeth. We have two examples, both of which are on loan to us. Um, one is a tambwa on loan from the, the estate of Dick Albright, which is um, just this simple expression of an amulet of power. Um, and the other is a fascinating piece that's on, on loan to us from Janet Sherlund, the former, uh, direct, uh, former uh, president of the board 
of uh, NHA and a, a, a wonderful a wonderful woman uh, who's been very generous with us and, and loaned us this tooth. It is a scrimshaw by the Britannia engraver, or at least Paul Vardaman says it's by the Britannia engraver, um, which was originally a tambwa. And um, the question that Stuart had when I first, it came up on the roadshow, when I was the host of the roadshow, Antiques Roadshow um, in Tucson, and it came to us from a woman whose maiden name was Burdette, uh, was, um, uh, sorry, was Bunker. And it was descended in her family from Captain John Bunker, whose name is inscribed on the tooth. Um, and it, I found in, an, in a, a, a narrative, a maroon narrative written by William Carey, an example of William Carey had gone out to Fiji, was marooned, and met a man named David Whitby out there, who was a Nantucketer that William uh, Carey had gone to school with. And um, they recount in this maroon narrative um, being paid in Tambwa for helping local chiefs in Fiji with a, uh, with a battle with other chiefs. They had uh, these, these uh, Nantucketers had access to, to firearms, to powder and shot ammunition, and uh, they were uh, paid very well for their services in pigs. Uh, they were paid with pigs, with dried fish, with, with kapa cloth, tapa cloth, and with whale's teeth. Um, and so that's an example of how a whale tooth could have come out of Fiji uh, as a very valuable object and then been uh, scrimshawed. Uh, obviously a commission by the captain uh, for his own keepsake purposes, which he then handed down through his family. Uh, well, we're very just interesting about story. To, it's yeah. great. We're, uh, we're pretty much out of time. We have one final question I want to ask, and then you're mentioning the, the pig has made me hungry for dinner. Um, <laughs> um, do we know of any modern scrim shanders doing designs today? Oh, for sure. There are modern scrim shanders. There's uh, Michel Veilleux, who works on Nantucket, is a modern scrim shander. Um, it's a, it's a, a difficult market to be in because, of course, you need to only work on teeth that can be documented to have been taken before 1972. Um, but there absolutely are scrim shanders working. Certainly were many who were working in the 20th century. Aletha Macy was a female scrim shander, uh, very famous. Um, and there were there were others. Um, Liz, you mentioned a woman who had scrimshot uh, Nancy Chase. Nancy Chase, the tops of um, baskets by Jose Formoso Reyes. Um, yes, there is modern scrimshot. You have to be really careful in uh, in acquiring it or in deaccessioning it. Uh, we at the museum don't take it uh, as, as as donation, or uh, and we don't purchase it. Uh, because of the restrictions in law. Okay, I guess we're going to wrap up now. I want to thank everyone Great. for staying with us for so long. Tremendous. We're about a half hour of what we planned, but we've got most of our our, our uh, attendees are still with us, and it's been a yeah, great talk. It's great. Thank you, Liz. Thank, thank you, you all. Thanks, Dan. Okay. Thank you, Alan, Mary, too, and and Liz. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Good night, everybody.